So now let's go to adrenal insufficiency. So where the adrenal gland is not making hormones. And we have primary, we can divide this into primary and secondary causes. So primary causes is due to direct damage of the adrenal gland itself. Same as always, primary is just damage of the, of the gland secreting the hormone. So because of that damage of the adrenal gland, you get deficiency of aldosterone and cortisol. Causes of this damage of the adrenal gland include autoimmune destruction. This is the most common cause. You can also have TB, which is the second most common cause, or other infections. And these, these infections, TB and other infections, cause chronic inflammatory damage. And finally, the other one you want to know about is you can get in, in a patient with sepsis from Neisseria meningitis in a young child, they can get an acute hemorrhage and a necrosis of the adrenal gland. So again, it's associated with a Neisseria meningitis. You see Neisseria meningitis in a young child, they get adrenal insufficiency, you know it's this problem. They had a, an acute hemorrhage and necrosis of the adrenal gland, and we call this waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. So this is high yield, actually. This it gets tested quite a bit. And again, the other causes, most common is chronic autoimmune destruction and then TB. So what symptoms would you get from primary adrenal insufficiency? And if you look at aldosterone, right, what I told you about aldosterone is the, the parameters you always want to look at with the aldosterone is blood pressure. You want to look at the potassium levels. And then you will also want to look at, you could also look at acid base if you want. Okay, so let's say acid base. And I'm just going to draw it for you one more time. This is the urine. This is the renal tubule with the urine. This is the, the kidney cell. You have sodium in that tubule. You have potassium and H+. And aldosterone helps stimulate the reabsorption of sodium. And then in return, you have to secrete potassium or H+. However, if you don't have enough aldosterone, this doesn't happen. So you have decreased sodium. So your blood pressure is going to be decreased. You have, you don't, you're not excreting that potassium, so you've increased potassium. You're not excreting H+, so you have too much H+. So now you have a metabolic acidosis. Okay, metabolic acidosis. And then cortisol does, does similar things. Remember, cortisol is also responsible for BP. Cortisol causes a basal constriction. So again, you have more decreased BP. So that's your clinical features. You're going to have hypotension and hyperkalemia from aldosterone and cortisol deficiency. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is what were the levels of ACTH and MSH be here? Remember, you have low levels of these hormones, so there's decreased feedback inhibition, so this is increased. Okay, so what's going to happen? What physical exam finding are you going to see? When you have the melanocyte stimulating hormone, you're going to get hyperpigmentation. Hyperpigmentation in primary adrenal insufficiency. All right, now we're going to go to secondary adrenal insufficiency. And what, what, what was the problem in secondary? I mean, it's not a problem with the gland itself, it's something that outside of the gland that's causing your gland to not work or in this case not work because it's insufficiency and what was the hormone that we talked about that stimulates the adrenal gland what hormone was made in the anterior pituitary so it's the ACTH so the problem here is your anterior pituitary is not making ACTH and thus your adrenal gland is not going to make aldosterone or cortisol and the main cause of this is usually with a patient who's getting a lot of glucocorticoids this is, a, this is a drug we often use for anti-inflammatory effects because cortisol and glucocorticoids have anti-inflammatory effects along with all the other effects. So they have a lot of glucocorticoids. It blocks this, shuts down that hypothalamic pituitary axis, decreases ACTH secretion. And when you're on it long term, your hypothalamus and your pituitary axis gets shut down pretty hard. So even when you, when you come off of these steroids, this is still not working, this is still shut off. You're still not making ACTH because it just got shut off from that chronic use. And so now you have nothing make, You have nothing providing that glucocorticoid or aldosterone. So now you have nothing and you have problems. So the way, so the, the clinical features are the same. You get hypotension, you get, um, however, what, what, are, what are your ACTH levels gonna be? I just told you you're not making ACTH, so you have low levels of ACTH. And then what happens to your MSH? Your MSH is also low, so so you do not have hyperpigmentation. No hyperpigmentation. And I emphasize this because this is an easy way for us to differentiate from primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency because you just look at whether there's hyperpigmentation or not. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about is that there will not be hyperkalemia. Why will there not be hyperkalemia? 
Will your aldosterone levels actually be low? That's the question. What stimulates aldosterone release? Well, ACTH stimulates aldosterone release, but the other thing that stimulates aldosterone release is this renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Okay, so at first you have low blood pressure, right? And what's going to happen? Your kidneys are going to sense that low blood pressure. They're going to increase renin. It's going to stimulate this whole axis. And this aldosterone is going to go to the to go to the adrenal gland and stimulate. Actually, angiotensin is going to go to the adrenal gland and stimulate aldosterone release. So now you're going to have increased aldosterone again, and you're not going to have hyperkalemia. You're going to be excreting potassium. Your potassium levels are going to be normal, but you will still have hypotension because you're not you're not going to have cortisol. So cortisol has that vasoconstriction effects. So next, we're going to talk about hyperaldosteronism. We just finished talking about hyper um, adrenal insufficiency, which is the low levels of aldosterone and cortisol. Here, this is just over secretion of aldosterone. You can have a primary or a secondary cause. The so primary cause we said is a problem with the hormone itself. So it's an adrenal adenoma or bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. It's caused aldosterone over secretion. And what's going to ha happen to your renin levels? Well, this is going to cause what is going to ha happen to your blood pressure. You have increased blood pressure. And remember that we said that the kidney senses the blood pressure, and the kidney needs low blood pressure to secrete renin. You have high blood pressure, you have low renin levels. Okay. Now, what is the cause of secondary hyperaldosteronism? Right, what do we say stimulates aldosterone? Is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system? So, if you have activation of this, you're gonna have too much too much renin, leading to too much aldosterone, and causes of renal vascular hyper uh, of of the secondary hyperaldosterone include renal vascular hypertension and causes of edema. That's because we have your kidney here, terrible drawing, and your vessels. Remember that remember that your it's your kidney that has to sense blood flow. So if there's something that's impeding blood flow, let's say there's a blockage here, even though your blood pressure here is normal, over here you have decreased blood pressure. Decreased blood pressure. Your kidney is going to think there's decreased blood pressure everywhere. It's going to activate this renin angiotensin aldosterone axis. You're going to get too much aldosterone. You're going to get, now this is going to be too much aldosterone, too much sodium and water reception, ret uh, retention. You get increased blood pressure everywhere. Same idea with edema because water, the, the volume is not in your vessels. It's in your interstitium. So you have low blood pressure in the kidney and you get this stimulation of the aldosterone system. Now clinical features of this. How will blood pressure, potassium levels, and blood pH change? Remember, I told you this is what you always want to think about when you're talking about aldosterone. So if you have too much aldosterone, you're going to get increased blood pressure, you're going to get decreased potassium, and then you're going to be excreting potassium as well as, as, well as hydrogen, so you have decreased hydrogen, so that's alkalosis. And that's, that's increased pH, so that's a metabolic alkalosis. Okay. Now, the w last thing I want to talk about is that the primary hyperaldosterone is not going to have edema. Even though you're going to have all this water retention, you're going to have all this sodium retention, you're not going to have edema in primary hyperaldosteronism because what's going to happen is, let's ignore that. we already talked about this a little bit, primary hyperaldosterone has too much aldosterone. You're going to get, initially, you're going to get increased sodium and H2O retention. And by the way, this part is a little lower yield, so you can just stop here. But I just want to talk about this. You do not get edema because this will cause two things. It's going to cause increased renal blood flow and renal filtration. And the second thing it's going to cause is you're going to have increased volume in your vessels. And what hormones release from the heart in response to increased volume from volume distension? Remember, the ANP, BNP, the natriuretic peptides, and both of these... What are they going to do? They're going to cause, you're going to have increased filtration and secretion of sodium. So that's naturesis. And you're also get, going to get diuresis. That's getting rid of water as well. So that's going to return your, your potassium, your, your blood volume levels back to normal. So you're not going to get, you're going to minimize your edema. Okay. So that is it for our review of hyperaldosteronism as well as adrenal insufficiency. Remember the key thing here is really understanding your aldosterone, how it works in the kidney in the collecting tubes, understanding that renin angiotensin aldosterone axis, 
and let me just go back adrenal insufficiency you can, knowing that hyperpigmentation is seen in primary but not in secondary and you should know obviously just from that feedback axis knowing waterhouse friedrichsen syndrome and you're good all right so that's it for this lecture